able to join us. So welcome to Spotlight on Local Authors Publishing in the 21st cen Century. This is Katherine Jones from Portage District Library. Um, tonight we have the honor of hosting authors Rachel Brownell, Mark Love, and Katherine Cowley. And I'm just going to do a short introduction of, for each of them and then we will get started. So Rachel Brownell is an award-winning author of young adult and new adult romance. She's a coffee addict who lives in Michigan with her husband, son, and fur babies. She's an avid reader, especially while she's soaking in a bubble bath, loves to play golf, and spends a lot of her summer nights watching her son play baseball. Since her journey began in 2012, she has published more than two dozen novels, and I believe she actually mentioned her 30th novel is coming out later this month. From dark and gritty to sweet young adult romance, she has something for every romance reader. Her new book, Half Truths, will be available on August 17th. And Mark Love is a freelance reporter turned mystery and suspense writer. Mark is a Michigan native who lived a good portion of his life in the Metro Detroit area. Although he's worked in many industries over the years, his passion has always been writing. Mark is the author of many mystery and suspense novels, as well as several pieces of short fiction. Mark recently added another installment to the gripping Jefferson Chen mysteries with Your Turn to Die, and released a novella entitled Don't Mess with the Gods in a collection called Magic and Mischief earlier this month. Catherine Cowley is a mystery author and writing teacher. Her debut novel, The Secret Life of Miss Mary Bennett, will be published in April 2021. Catherine read Pride and Prejudice for the first time when she was 10 years old, and she loved it so much she reread it a few months later. She loves history, chocolate, traveling, and playing the piano. She lives in Kalamazoo, Michigan with her husband and three daughters. A number of her short stories have been published, including Tatterhood and the Prince's Hand, and she teaches writing at Western Michigan University. So without further ado, let's officially welcome our panel. And I don't know um, if you can see all of our uh, participants, but we have um, about 15 people joining us right now. So thank you everyone for joining us. So let's go ahead and get started because I know everyone is not here to listen to me talk. They're here to talk with all of our experienced local authors. So let's just get to know you a little bit better. Tell us about yourself and how did you become a writer? And Rachel, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, well, I put my son on a bus to go to kindergarten and not being used to uh, having time on my hands where I'm not chasing a child, I did a nice deep clean of my house and came across a book that I had written when I was very young. I was like 16 or 17. and. <clears throat> It was pretty bad and so I kind of felt like my characters needed you know their happily ever after and so I rewrote that book and then it just kind of flourished from there so I started out in traditional publishing I've worked with small press and currently I have all of my books self-published and I'm a little OCD so I prefer it that way um, I like to have my hands on a little bit of everything uh, I dabble in helping other authors with the formatting of their books and um, just, you know, this industry is, it's so much fun and, it, and it, it is, it can be stressful, but if you kind of really, if you have a passion for it, it can be one of the most rewarding and most fun jobs anywhere. Um, so that, that's my, my short of my story. There's a lot that's happened in the last, whoa seven or eight years now, I think. I started in 2012, so I'm going on eight years this fall. That's wonderful. What a way to get started, you know, just trying to give your characters their due. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, why don't you tell us about how you got started with authorship? Well, I've always been an avid reader, and when I was in college uh, a long time ago, I was able to take a couple of creative writing classes and the professor was very encouraging and kept hinting, you know, you should try 
writing short stories. I said, I really want to work on a novel. He said, try short stories first, and then you can build up a little momentum and see how it goes. And that was where I started. And I had some success with short stories back then, but then I had to put my efforts at writing on hold because of work and family and other responsibilities, but I always wanted to get back to it. It was about 12 years ago when things changed a little bit and I had a little more free time and I said, kids are grown, now's an opportunity for me to try and write and see if I can really make something out of it. And uh, it's five novels later and a couple of novellas and a number of other short stories. And as Rachel said, it, it, it's a job, but it can be a lot of fun really enjoy doing it. That's wonderful. So Catherine, uh, tell us, you kind of come from a teaching background and now you're making your way into uh, publishing a novel. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I, I've i always loved writing. I The first story I wrote was when I was five years old and we watched like an Icarus movie in kindergarten and it really disturbed me that he did something he wanted, he flew close to the sun and then he died and that was wrong. So then I wrote a story about a turtle who got too close to the sun but, and then my turtle fell in the ocean but turtles can swim and he turned yellow. So he was not unchanged because we can never be unchanged. Um, so that was kind of my attempt to, uh, to fix the Icarus story when I was five. Um, so I've always loved writing but I was very I was kind of practical and in college, I thought I, you know, I'm not going to study creative writing. Um, and I ended up doing my master's in rhetoric and composition. So the teaching of nonfiction writing is kind of what I focused on. Um, and so I used to teach at Western Michigan University. Um, but so after though I graduated with my master's degree, I decided, well, maybe I actually like, why am I just setting this aside? I'm gonna actually try this. So I did NaNoWriMo, which is where you write an entire na novel in a month. And I did that in 2010 and it was terrible and I hated it and I hated the process. And I, I guess I don't actually want to be an author. I'm like, that's fine. I've tried it, I can move on and do these other things I want to do. And then the bug came back and I'm like, well, maybe I just don't want to do NaNoWriMo again. Um, so I never revised that book. Um, and then I started writing short stories and I got some of those published and getting feedback from editors and peers and going to writing conferences. So slowly over the last, um, you know, 10 years, I've, you know, published short stories and novellas and other things. And this is my third revised novel that I've written, but it's, um, I, it's the first one that will be published. So. That's exciting. I know I am a Jane Austen fan myself, so I can't wait to read it, but, uh, it's just really um, wonderful when you know you've dabbled with something so long and it's finally coming together. Um, so let's jump into the you know you all started writing, you had something that kind of jump started the process, but what made you uh, decide to try to become published? Um, what was kind of the catalyst for that process? Um, why don't why don't we go the opposite way around? So Catherine, do you do you mind starting with that? Sure. I, I feel like writing is a bit like baking in the sense that you can decide I want to bake cupcakes and you can make these like amazing cupcakes and you can just make them once a year at Thanksgiving and share them with your family or you can submit them to the you know county fair or state fair or you could decide I actually want to own a bakery and I feel like getting published is like saying I want to own a bakery or I want to be a chef at someone else's baker bakery. And so for me, it was just something that I really wanted to get an audience for these stories and share those. And so that's what kind of compelled me to want to publish. That's great. Mark, how did you um, come to the publishing process? What got you started? Well, with the encouragement of that professor in the creative writing class, it was to submit stories and not be afraid of rejection because it happens. You know, not everybody's going to sell it on the first time. Um, and when I was working on my first novel, I had a couple of friends that were very, very interested in reading 
and they wanted to check it out. And I said, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I'm not sure if it's going to be any good or whatever. They were very positive, very encouraging me. You've got to try and publish this because this is a good story. And, and you could reach more people if you get it published. And at the time, I thought, well, we'll give it a shot and see what we can do. And the more feedback that I got that way, the more encouragement it was and the more I was really interested in seeing if I could, in fact, get this story published. And if one goes, hey, what's next? Maybe we'll get the next one, too. That's great. It really shows the importance of feedback throughout the whole process, whether it's teachers or mentors or friends or publishers. It's important. So Rachel, tell us about your publishing journey. How did you first become published and uh, what was that process like for you? So <clears throat> I had something similar to Mark where, you know, you write this book, but you just, you, you don't know how good it is. You love it. You love your words, but really will other people like it? So I had similar to Mark, a uh, friend read my work and she was very encouraging. She was actually reading it as I wrote the book. And when it was finished, her first words were, so you're going to publish this, right? And this is before indie publishing really blew up. Um, it was still more of a traditional publishing era. And so I did the whole submit, 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 reject, reject, reject. Um, and then I finally had someone pick it up. And unfortunately, that someone, which I won't name, because um, I don't want to shame anybody on the internet and get in trouble for it. Um, it ended up being what is considered a vanity press. So if you're not familiar with what a vanity press is, um, let me just start by saying you, if you are traditionally published, you will never pay the publisher any money. And a vanity press takes your money and they say it's for editing and for cover and all of these other things, marketing and whatnot, which FYI marketing for them is like 2 a.m. infomercials. Um, the ones that nobody ever sees. So, you know, I got drug into that and thankfully able to get my rights back to my book and went, um, at that point in time, by the time I got my rights back, I was able to step into self-publishing rather seamlessly because it was, it had really started to pick up and um, for as much grief as Amazon gives indie publishers, they do make it very easy for us to self-publish our books. Um, and I've just been going from there since then. So, and I probably will never look back. I, I have not submitted a book for traditional publishing since 2012. And I probably won't ever, I really do like the creative control. So I, I know Mark, you, Mark, are you hybrid published? Are you traditional and indie published? Um, it's small published, small houses that are, but they're traditional publishers, so. Okay. I wasn't sure which direction your books had gone. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's indie publishing is fantastic. It gives you a lot of creative control, but there are so many aspects of it that you have to be willing to manage. Um, and I mean, I'm kind of a micromanager, so it works for me. I mean, yeah, that's, just, that's one the way my mind that works. Found, that you found the process that works for you. And that I think is, is key to this whole thing. Um, just for those who are watching who are maybe not as familiar with the publishing process, does somebody want to take on the challenge of describing like what indie, uh, what uh, hybrid and what traditional publishing means? So, um, so indie publishing is when you, you know, as Rachel was saying, that you're in control of all the steps. So you're, you know, hiring your own editor on your own copy editor and you're either creating your cover if you're a graphic designer as well or you're hiring you know someone to create your cover and so you're doing all these steps you're formatting you are selling and promoting that um a hybrid hybrid actually i have friends that are hybrid that and it can have a whole range of meaning um but often you might have bo some books traditionally published some books self-published um and then traditional publication um for at least for me the process was so this was actually my third novel that I submitted to agents. So you get your book as ready as you can make it. You revise it and critique it and, you know, get it as good as you can make it. And then you start submitting it to agents uh, because for m many of the larger publishing houses, 
they won't publish you, um, you know, they won't even consider your work unless you have an agent that's representing you. So then the first task is then finding an agent. So my, for my first two books, I wasn't able to find an agent. Um, for this third book, I ended up submitting to this, you know, so for The Secret Life of Miss Mary Bennett, I submitted to 54 agents. Um, I got a number of requests for full manuscripts where people want to read the whole book and I got one offer, but fortunately it was an amazing agent, kind of a dream agent. She had a great vision for the book. She helped me revise it. And then she started submitting it. So it was actually really nice. Like it was the stressful part was submitting it to agents. And then it was like, and now I just kind of do my own thing and, and let the agent um, sell it. And so then agents will then approach publishing houses. They'll approach editors they know, and they will, you know, you know, pitch your book. And then if someone's interested, they'll negotiate a contract. Um, and so with, you know, so right now I'm in that process of, so I have a contract, I've signed, I send them feedback on what I'm interested in for a cover. We'll see if that looks anything like what it is. Um, <laughs> and, you know, right now the editor's going through it and I'm going to be getting feedback back on my book in the next couple of weeks. And then we'll do a copy edit where you're looking more kind of sentence level things and continuity um, and then a proofread and, and then there'll be advanced reader copies. So it's kind of this whole, you know, big process of, but they take care of a lot. However, with traditional publishing, whether you're a big house or a small house, unless you're a really big author, you're still expected to do a lot of your own marketing and promotion, whether or not you're, you know, hybrid or traditional published, it, you're still doing that. So for me, the big difference between self-publishing and traditional publishing um, with self-publishing, you get so much creativity that you can put into it. And unfortunately, with traditional publishing, like you said, Catherine, is you submitted what you wanted for your cover and you'll see what they come back with. Um, the publishing house ultimately has the decision on it. So, you know, if they want you to cut an entire chapter because they don't want it in the book, you know, they get that ultimate say. If they want this cover over that cover, they get the ultimate say. And so, you know, for both, you're doing your own marketing. Publishing houses are not known to market your book unless you are a big named author because they want it to sell even better. But um, no matter who you are, if you're with a traditional house or self-published, you are doing all of that marketing yourself 110% um, because, you know, otherwise your book just kind of sits there and it's going to be among the millions and millions on whatever ebook site or in Barnes and Noble, if you're lucky, however you want to do it, because that's the other big thing is, so <clears throat> with traditional publishing houses, they do what's called a book buyback. So I can have any of my books at Barnes and Noble, if I'm traditionally published, all they have to do is order them. And then if they don't sell, the publishing house will buy them back. They have the option to get their money back for what they purchase. Um, with indie book publishing, unless you l use certain printers, you don't have that option. So when you go into Barnes and Noble and you say, oh, I'm looking for a book by this person and they're an indie published author, the chances are you won't find it there because if they purchase that book, they are, there is absolutely no way for Barnes and Noble to get their money back if it doesn't sell. And it'll just sit on the shelf and collect dust. And they're not willing to take that investment. So a lot that to happens. consider. I'm sorry. Oh, um, just a lot to consider and a lot of perseverance, either path you choose. Go ahead, Mark. I, I was going to say, in addition to Barnes and Noble, you'll see that with some small bookstores, the independent stores as well because they're concerned about buying something. And then if it doesn't sell, they're stuck with it. They don't have that opportunity of returning it to the publisher. So whether you're an independent or working with a small press, you're in that same situation, so. Yeah. So it can be kind of sobering as, you know, somebody looking at writing or who maybe has written a story or a book and they're thinking about getting published, but then they hear all these stories about how much work it is and that sort of thing. So what, what advice would you give those who are looking to get published or maybe who are just getting started with writing? They have that bug of an idea and it needs to come out. 
I'll, I'll let anyone jump on this question. Well, for me, I guess the best advice I can give someone is to go into this with your eyes wide open because writing the book is actually going to be the easiest thing you do in this process. So as you go through the process, everything gets just a little bit more challenging, um, whether it's your first book or your 10th you know, you still have to go through the same process. So for me, you know, like the book that I'm releasing next month, I had it finished in May. Like, and it's just, it's gone through all its processes and its steps and everything like that. And I've actually written two books since I finished that book because it, there's so much that you do after you write the book. And that first initial draft that you go through is going to be the easiest thing you do. And the last thing you do is going to be your marketing, but your marketing actually starts the second you finish that book. So the marketing is the longest piece and it's the hardest part, no matter if you're traditional or indie or hybrid, you know, finding your niche and finding those readers so that your book actually sells. So if there's someone who really wants to get into this and, you know, they're passionate about their writing and they want to be published, they need to do as much research as they can on the whole process and know exactly what they're getting into, no matter which route they decide to take. If you're looking to do something along the lines of whether it's a traditional publisher or working with an agent, there are some resources available. Uh, when I first started looking for publishers, I was using Writer's Digest, which had a great guide for novels and short story market, as well as for literary agents. And like Catherine, I tried to get an agent for a while and I just, I got tired of banging my head against the wall and not getting any positive responses. So then I started looking at publishers that would accept material directly from the author as opposed to dealing with an agent. And that's where I went in that process. I, I will say though, with Amazon and the influx of eBooks, there are some people that will self-publish and not go in print copy. They'll strictly go in ebook, but you still have, as Rachel said, you still have all the marketing, you have all of the editing, all of the promotion work, the copying, the, you know, the cover art, all of that's on you if you're going strictly independent, even if you're going with an ebook. I, mean, I think the advice I would give is just to make sure that your book is as good as you can get it before you, whether or not you want to self-publish or small press or go try to do, you know, an agent or anything, you want to get it as good as you can. And often that takes, you know, writing groups and critique partners and studying the craft and whether that's through checking out books from the library and reading on about those or going to conferences or, you know, whatever method you choose, it really, I felt like, you know, it's like I had a master's in English with an emphasis in composition, and yet there was so much that I had to learn about writing and about creative writing and about storytelling and how to make characters shine and how to get their emotions, which I understood what they were feeling at this motion, you know, at this moment. But my critique partners were like, there's no emotion here on this page. And that was one of those things I had to learn. And so it's just being willing to, you know, because um, whichever method you have, you know, whether you're self-publishing or going to, you know, an agent, like your readers are going to sense there's no emotion in your characters or your readers are going to sense this isn't as good as it could be. And they're not going to get past the first couple pages or an agent's going to sense the same thing or a publisher, you know, so it's really taking the time to draft and revise and be humble. It doesn't mean you have to follow everyone's advice. I get advice all the time from critique partners that I'm like, okay, I can see what they're saying, but I'm not going to use that. But it's being willing to be open to it so you can recognize, wow, I really do need to improve this thing in my work. And then you start getting better at being able to recognize in your own work how it needs to be improved and how, how you can revise it. I think you have thick skin if you're gonna be a writer. You're never gonna please everybody. You're going to get rejections. You're going to get somebody say, I didn't like that, you know, or why did you kill off that character? I really like that one. That was part of the story. And as Catherine said, I think you really have to go through it and edit 
I would encourage anybody that's interested in writing to just get it down, write the story first. Don't worry about making every page, the first page perfect, just get it down. And then you can always go back and do editing and see what you need to do. And if you're sharing it with a critique partner or some friends, make sure these are people that are gonna be objective, that aren't gonna read your story and go, oh, that was nice. I don't want nice, I wanna get a real reaction from you. You know, was it, did it get you excited? Were you bored by the fifth page or whatever? That's the kind of feedback you wanna get. Great advice. What was, so out of curiosity, how many drafts would you say you go through um, for your first book? <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I went through three rounds of edits with this most recent one. And I did three rounds of self edits and that's after I wrote the book. So. And this is your, your most recent one would be like your 30th book. Yeah. yeah. Depending on how you count them, it could be 31 or 33, but I'm calling it 30 cause the other ones are short bonus books. So um, it's, everybody's process is going to be different. So what takes me six rounds might take somebody else three rounds. It might take somebody else 10 rounds. Um, you know, I communicate back and forth with a couple of different beta readers who I've been working with for years. And I have an editor that I've been working with for years that we go two rounds and, you know, and then myself personally, I do at least one round prior to all of them and at least two rounds after. And the only thing that helps me catch the little mistakes is actually reading my book out loud. So I have to make sure nobody's home because I'll sit in my office on my e-reader and read the words out loud. And then I'll see where I, because I've read the book so many times, I know what it's supposed to say. Mm -hmm. um, but if you read it out loud, like it went to the, you'll actually catch your mistakes, or at least I do. Um, but the first draft is never the, the best draft, not for me. I think I, I add more during the second and third round than I do anything. Yeah, my, my drafts get longer. Um, so I'm working on my second Mary Bennett book right now. And my first draft was 45,000 words, which is rather sh way too short for an adult novel, but that's actually really normal for me for my first draft. Because even though I've kind of outlined and thought some, some of my th same things, I, ha I can't figure all of it out until I've written the whole story. So I finished writing that and I realized, oh, I wrote a book of subplots. There's no actual plot in here. Okay, well, I'll add a plot. And then I was like, and, oh, I really want to add this character. Oh, and, you know, I actually, my agent said, well, aren't you going to bring this character back? And I'm like, that actually would work really well. And so all of a sudden this draft, I added the main plot and I added multiple characters, which requires you edit everything. Um, and, you know, so now this, my second draft is now 90,000 words. So, but I ended up cutting at least 30,000 of the first draft. And so maybe 15,000 words managed to stay in this second draft. And now I have the second draft, I've sent it off to my critique partners. I'll get it back for them and I'll revise several more passes uh, and I'll send it to my agent and I'll revise again before I submit it to my publisher and say, here's book two that I promised you. And so it takes me, you know, I outline, but that doesn't mean I have everything figured out. I outline so I can get through the story and push through the first draft, but then I still have to go a long ways. I hope you kept all those subplots because that could be part of book three. And book well, no, the three. subplots are still in book two. That They were all great. They are beautiful, shiny subplots that are all still there. It just needed an actual, like, the big mystery was was missing. So, so there's a big Tie mystery. it all together. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, the last, well, the last work that I had just completed that um, was released this month was Don't Mess With the Gods. It was a novella. And our target was 25,000 words. Uh, this was something different for me because it was in a paranormal genre. And I was also working with a co-writer. And so this was very interesting. We went through, Ellie Castle and I wrote this, and we went through about four rounds of edits 
between the two of us before we submitted it to the publisher. And then after we got it back, we got the acceptance and the contract and everything else. We then did five rounds of edit between the editor and the two of us that were writing it going back and forth. Thank goodness for emails. I tell you, I could have never done this with snail mail. Never would have happened. But we went through so many rounds of edits and we caught so many little mistakes or I would see something go, oh, I, did we do that? Okay, and we would fix it and, and go back and forth. So it's an ongoing process. It is. You never, um, you know, as a librarian, I'm surrounded with books all the time and you don't often think about how much work and how much time and probably how much blood sweat and tears actually went into every one of those works but it's it's really a gift from our authors um well i know that some of our attendees are hoping to hear a couple of excerpts um so why don't uh mark i know you uh, mentioned that you have an excerpt ready to go do you mind reading that for us? And while you pull that up, I'll mention to our attendees, um, we'll do a short Q&A at the um, end of the session. So if you have a question you would like the authors to address, please feel free to put that in the chat and we will get to it momentarily. All right, take it away, Mark. All right, All right. this is an excerpt from Your Turn to Die, which is the second novel in the Jefferson Shane mystery series. Uh, in this scene, Detective Jefferson Shane is interviewing Valerie Mann. She is the office manager for Kyle Morrissey, who was brutally murdered during a war game of paintball. And here we go. It's a bad idea to lie to a cop, Valerie. Sooner or later, the truth comes back to bite you in the ass. Her body jolted as if I'd slapped her. There may be something in Kyle's contact list. He didn't keep business cards. When someone gave him one, he put the details on his computer. And you have access to that file? Yes, it's on the network. Let's take a look. I could have had the cyber unit scan the files, but there was a chance she'd give me more than just a name or number. Valerie turned to the computer and pulled the chair closer to the desk as I came around beside her. Why did you lie to me? She shifted her head just enough to look me in the eye. I don't like you. It's not a popularity contest. I'm trying to figure out who killed your boss. You're abrasive, I shrugged, if I have to be. Your mother must be so proud. Her voice was dripping with sarcasm. I wouldn't know, I never met her. Valerie opened her mouth to say something, but no words came out. Her cheeks and throat flushed scarlet. She swallowed once and turned her attention to the computer. I watched as she scrolled through a list of files and brought up a folder labeled contacts. So there must be some other reason you lied other than not liking me. I just don't see how any of this could help you find his killer. I pointed at the computer monitor. Slowly, she ran through the list of names. Valerie stopped occasionally to jot down the details for several people listed as attorneys. It was tempting to see if there were any recent emails between them and Morrissey. I was about to ask, but figured the cyber unit would be able to tell me. We finished with the list. Valerie switched off the computer. Want to tell me about the lie? She let out a ragged breath. You're impossible. I rested a hip on the desk. She remained in the big chair. Self-consciously, she crossed her legs, then tugged the hem of her skirt down toward her knee. It didn't cover much. I'm in no hurry. I thought you were trying to catch a killer. I am, but my boss gets pissed if I do a sloppy job and miss something. Valerie folded her hands in her lap. I have nothing more to say. Unless you have questions related to Mr. Morrissey's business dealings, I'm going to ask you to leave. We have a number of things to finish up before tomorrow's services. I decided not to push it. She was obviously holding something back. Whether it was pertinent to the case was anyone's guess. 
Tucking the papers into my pocket, I pushed away from the desk. Valerie stayed in the chair. Goodbye, Sergeant. I'll see you around, Miss Mann. It was obviously wasn't the response she was hoping for. There you go. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Mark. And You're again, that one was from Your Turn to Die, the Jefferson Chen mystery, right? Jefferson Shane mystery. Yes. Shane, thank you. Um, we have those mysteries at the library. So if you're interested in checking out that book, uh, feel free to stop by sometime. Um, Catherine, I know you mentioned that you also have an excerpt. Uh, do you want to go ahead and read that? Sure. So my novel is called The Secret Life of Miss Mary Bennett. And the idea is this is Mary Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. And she's a, the dull, plain sister, but she's actually a spy for the British government. Um, so this book, is, the first novel is about her becoming a spy. And at the beginning of the novel, Mr. Bennett has died and Mr. Collins is of course kicking them out of their house, which Mrs. Bennett had predicted that he would do before Mr. Bennett was in the grave and indeed he does. And so Mary's invited to stay with a distant relative. Lady Trafford. And so she goes and, you know, she's already started noticing suspicious things. The, the morning rings for her family's morning rings were stolen. And um, this distant relative, Mr. Withrow, Lady Trafford's nephew, you know, was sneaking around her father's things and other things. So she's a little suspicious, but she's gone and she's having a, taking a tour of Castle Durrington, which is where Lady Trafford lives. And so she's taking a tour of Castle Durrington with the housekeeper, Mrs. Boughton. So I will start there. And now, said Mrs. Boughton, for my favorite part of the tour, the South Terrace and the Lawns. Mary did not want to continue the tour with Mrs. Boughton, but she knew it would be impolite to refuse. But people like Elizabeth always managed to do things that could be impolite, yet in a way that did not give others offense. Perhaps Mary would try it. She pictured her older sister in her mind and decided on the pop proper phrasing. I would truly love to see the terrace, but I am feeling great fatigue from my long journey. Perhaps we can continue it another day. But it is well worth seeing the back of the house. I can make it a short excursion. Mary had seen plenty of backs of houses. They were typically a duller version of the front. I need to lie down, Mary said flatly. Mrs. Boughton looked as if she was about to protest, but then thought better of it. As the grand staircase did not lead to the second floor, it was covered by a dome, they went up the smaller spiral staircase. Even though Mrs. Boughton had agreed to continue the tour another day, she would not stop talking. There were over a dozen rooms with one section reserved for visiting relatives. Mrs. Boughton, Boughton pointed out her own room. It is close to yours and I will act as a chaperone until Lady Trafford returns. And the nursery. Should Mr. Withrow ever choose to marry and produce heirs? And then she finally brought Mary to the room that would be hers during her stay. Her room was on the north side of the house, the side from which the carriage had approached. From her windows, besides the clearing in front of the house and a glimpse of the road, all Mary could see were trees, some with a few leaves turning their fall colors. After Mrs. Boughton had verified that all of Mary's cases had been brought up, she left Mary so she could rest. As soon as the door was closed, Mary opened the case with her music and found her error. It was an easy part. How could she completely have forgotten the opening movement? She wanted to return to the pianoforte, but stopped herself short of the door. She had used the excuse that she was tired to get out of the rest of the tour, but now that prohibited her from using the pianoforte. Next time, she would come up with a different polite reason, and next time she would not decline refreshment after traveling. Mary lay down on the bed, holding her music to her chest. This castle, no, house, was grander even than Netherfield, where Mr. Bingley had lived for a time, and compared to the residence of the Phillipses, well, she should not compare her aunt's house to this place. Perhaps she should have stayed there, in a place that was, a, was familiar, with people who were familiar. At least there, she knew her place in the world. Here, more seemed possible, yet it also made her future feel more uncertain. But there was no use in looking back. Her decision had been made and she would make the best of it. She set her music to the side and tried falling asleep, but too much afternoon light shone through the window. 
She rose and walked to the window, but instead of closing the curtain, she gazed outside at the walk and the trees. She removed her mourning ring. She read her father's name and date of death, then flipped the bezel to reveal the clip of hair. She pressed the translucent stone to her lips. Change was inevitable, and death, as the philosophers like to say, was but a natural part of life. But while she would suffer through it with resolve, that did not mean she had to relish her suffering. A movement, or perhaps a light, caught Mary's attention. She peered out her window. There, in the trees, a red light flashed two more times. A minute later, the light flashed again three times. What even made a red light strong enough to be seen through trees in the daytime? She waited, but the light did not flash again. Yet a minute or two later, someone walked away from Castle Durrington toward the light. She recognized his clothes and his hair. It was Withrow. She tightened her fingers around the fabric of the curtain. Withrow could be engaged in business for the estate, but then why the mysterious red light? It seemed like a signal to her, a secret signal that most people were not meant to understand. What he did was none of her concern, yet she could not stifle her curiosity. This was the man who had searched her parents' room, after all, and she still did not know why he had done so. She might never learn why, but at least she could discover what occupied him now. If Mrs. Boughton questioned her leaving her room, she would simply state that she had received sufficient rest. Mary took the small, the small spiral staircase down two flights, all the way to the main floor. A servant stood at attention in the front entryway. Would you please open the door, she asked. He did so, asking, where are you going, miss? I need a bit, a bit of fresh air, said Mary. She should not need to justify her movements to Lady Trafford's servants. Are you in need of assistance? No, I am quite independently minded. As she stepped away from the castle, she realized that the servant might report to Withrow that she had left the house. She did not want the servant to know that she was following his master, so she veered to the left as if she was headed to the side of the house. After a minute, she turned back towards the place in the trees where she had seen the light. As she neared the trees, she slowed. She stepped over branches and around fallen logs, keeping as quiet as possible. She heard quiet voices, not truly audible, and as she neared them, she crouched down into some shrubbery. She pushed aside a branch and peered at the two figures who stood a bit further forward. One was unmistakable. It was Withrow. The other took her a moment to place, in part because his presence was so unexpected. The man had a mustache and a beard, which changed the look of his facial structure, and his hair was now a darker color. But despite these changes, Mary recognized him. Mr. Withrow was meeting with the man who had attempted to steal her family's mourning rings. Well, that sounds like a thrilling mystery. Um, if you're interested in reading that book, uh, it will be just a few more months uh, to next spring, right? April yeah. 2021? Mm -hmm. So the library will hopefully be getting a couple of copies of The Secret Life of Miss Mary Bennett, and uh, then you'll be able to hear the rest of the story. Rachel, I think you said that you have a book coming out um, next month. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that book or read an excerpt, whichever you prefer? Um, I don't have the book on me. My paperbacks will be here Friday. Um, with COVID, shipping has taken about three weeks longer than normal. Um, so this one is, it's an, uh, it's an opposites of track romance. So you've got this rich boy who is checking his sister into rehab. And he, of course, falls for her counselor. Who else? Because it's the forbidden love. And things for her are even more complicated than things are for him. So they're both trying to escape the stereotypes that they've been brought up with. Um, you know, she grew up poor, trash, like she considers herself white trash, um, just having to raise her mother instead of her mother raising her. Um, but she did, you know, she turned her life around and made something of herself. So her mother was a drug addict. And so she made it her mission to turn around and help drug addicts. Um, and so their story kind of goes from there, but um, he needs to stay in the city and they're not in Chicago, they're in San Diego. So he has to stay there with his sister while she's doing um, her rehab and moves in across the hall from her. And so she finds it very hard to avoid him. Um, he is basically everywhere she turns and there's a lot of secrets that she's keeping 
a lot of truths in her life that aren't exactly the entire truth. And so that's kind of where the, the title stems from because both of them are only giving so much information to the other person to keep a good portion of what they're doing hidden. Um, so not to give the story away because it says it right in chapter one. Um, but you know, his truth is that his parents aren't really dead. So the only way he could check his sister into rehab is to claim to be her legal guardian. So he metaphorically killed his parents, um, though he would not be sorry to see them go. That's the relationship he has with them. Um, and her truth, which is, oh gosh, it's revealed in like the second or third chapter, um, is her son is not actually her son. Her son is her little brother um, who she took from the poor situation that she grew up in. So you've got these people who are basically dancing around each other and trying not to fall in love with each other, yet everywhere they look, there's the, they're right there in front of them. So um, there's a lot more hidden within the story, but um, I've been told I write these very emotional books and uh, I don't feel like this book should make people cry, but all of my reviews so far are like bring tissues. And I don't know why I'm trying to figure out what made him cry because I wasn't aiming for that. I have, I have my one tear jerker book that um, I will actually, like if I see you at a signing, one or two of my books, I will actually hand you a pack of like little travel tissues because you're going to need them. This is, th that was not the intent with this book. Half truths and proximity. It sounds like great fuel for romance. And, and apparently tissues. Uh, who knew? I didn't do it on purpose this time. Well, these all sound like amazing books and you are all so talented. It's a pleasure to have your work at the library. Um, we're nearing the end of the time, so I'm just going to open it up in case anyone in attendance has questions. Um, feel free to throw those in the chat box um, and then we will answer them. You can also um, raise your hand and I believe I will be able to um, make it so you can talk if you wish to ask a question. Um, I am just going to ask one more question while we're waiting to see if our audience has any additional things they would like to add. What was the uh, best piece of advice you received from somebody about writing? And how did you end up applying it to your writing journey? For me, I went to a signing uh, with Shannon Hale, or, you know, advice Shannon Hale for one of Shannon Hale's new books. And someone asked her, you know, what her advice was. And she said, write 500 words every day. Um, and that was when I decided that I was going to be a consistent writer. Now, for me, my writing process isn't exactly like that. I spend time on writing every day, but there are days that are research days or days that are like forced active daydreaming days where I'm working out plot problems in my head, you know, but, but just spending, you know, really making space for that and spending that work time every single day has made the biggest difference for me in kind of my in my writing I, I think for me the best one that i had was i actually got to meet elmore leonard the great novelist uh in detroit when i was there he wrote a lot of crime novels a lot of things like get shorty and uh, continued on to movies as well and he was at a book signing and I just happened to walk into this place, didn't even realize he was there. He was at a little table, like a card table, stack of books. And he's just sitting there and I walked up to him stunned and I was going to buy a book and there was nobody else around. I talked to him for about 20 minutes. It was great. And one of the things that he said was, it doesn't matter if you write on a computer, on a typewriter, on a legal pad, if you talk it out on an audio, just write, get it down. And then I found out he writes on a legal pad and then he sits down at an old, I don't know if it was a manual or an electric typewriter. He didn't use a computer. And that's what he would then, he would spend a whole day working on one scene and then he would type it up when he got it right. But the idea was whatever method works, just keep doing it. You know, for me, it's, uh, it's a lot of little advice here and there that, you know, I've met some 
really amazing authors over the years. Um, but I think the one thing that really stuck with me the most was to study your craft. So if you write thrillers, you want to read thrillers. If you write romance, you want to read romance. If you write historical, you want to read historical because you need to know what everybody else is doing. You need to know not so much your competition, but the trends. So you, you know, the biggest advice I could give to anybody right now, if you're thinking about starting this is study your craft, know who you're writing for, know your audience, because, you know, I unfortunately made a lot of mistakes when I started out. Um, you know, I still make mistakes, but I've learned who my audience is and I've learned how, what they want. And, you know, I will never write to market, which is what everybody says to do, write what people want to read. No, I'm going to write what I want to write. Um, but I know my audience as well. And that's, you know, you're not, you will not be able to sell books to just anybody. You have to know who it is that's gonna wanna read what you're writing. Um, so just study your craft and know your audience. That's the biggest advice I can give anybody right now. And it's forever changing. Like every two months you have to just stay up with it. Definitely. Well, especially right now when so many people are at home and reading and trying new books. What great advice. Thank you all for sharing. And we do have some um, audience questions. Uh, so this one's from Michelle. Uh, she says, Rachel, as an independent publisher, how do you get your books reviewed? So I actually have a personal assistant. Um, who I work with, it's, I guess you could call her a virtual assistant because she doesn't actually, we don't meet in person. Um, but she handles a lot of that for me. So for instance, right now with my book that's coming up, I have tours set up with bloggers. Um, I have advanced copies that have already gone out. I think we've sent out close to 75 advanced copies. Um, and then I have a secondary PR company that I'm using for this release that will be sending out another 30 to 40. Um, you know, reviews are so hard to come by. I mean, you could sell a thousand books and get 10 reviews. Um, it really is, you know, the best thing you can do for an author to support them is buy their books, but then review the book when you're done. And it, it could be one sentence or five paragraphs. Um, to us, the fact that you took the time to do it really helps. Um, but like my preliminary reviews that I have coming in are all going to be from people who've received advanced copies. And I have my, my uh, assistant to thank for that because she handles all of that for me. She sends them all out. She posts them where they need to be posted on the websites that um, like people have to sign up for that are verified reviewers. Um, but when it does come to reviews, there is one key piece of information that I want to pass along is you should never pay anyone to review your book um, with the exception of sites like Kirkus Reviews. Um, you should never be paying bloggers or random people on the internet to review your book. Um, it is a big no-no in the industry, whether you're traditionally published or uh, anything hybrid independently. Great advice. Um, so how did, uh, just to follow up in case uh, the audience wants more information, how did you end up getting uh, set up with your personal assistant? How did that get started? Um, she was the personal assistant of somebody else and I was seeing the work that she did. Um, she has her own PR company, so she is definitely legit. Um, but you know, it's just, when you enter this community, no matter how you're publishing, um, you have to interact with the community and get to know the community. I mean, like I know Mark for years now because you know I'm active in, in the community and unfortunately that's all virtual, it's all online. Um, but that's how, I, that's how I met my, no, I met my editor at an event. Um, but you know, we communicate virtually. Um, I've met a lot of my readers that are now a more important part of my process at events or online. Um, you just have to be active and do your research. Um, there's a lot of companies out there. If someone is looking for a personal assistant, there are a lot of companies out there that offer those services on a monthly basis, a weekly basis. Um, you know, some you contract, some you don't. Um, and you can get uh, 
like reviews of the companies as well. Great advice, especially the, you know, being active in the writing community and getting to know everyone. All right, so here's another question. Um, quote, forced active daydreaming. Uh, how can you go into how you force or encourage daydreaming or ideation? And I believe this one's for Catherine. So a lot of it is that I have to have had a reason why I've been thinking about these characters or about the story. You know, there's either something with the plot or something with the characters, whether it's a short story or a novel, there's something that got me excited. And so sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll jot down notes about what got me excited, but I won't start writing it until I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And sometimes this is just as I fall asleep, I'll just be like, well, what would this character do? Or what would happen if she was with him here? Or wouldn't it be so cool if she went to a ball dressed as someone else and then all her family is there and she knows that they'll be able to recognize her even with her disguise. And so I'll just sit there and I'll think, okay, these are, you know, so I'll start coming up with, these are cool interactions or cool scenes or cool ideas that I might want to use. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it's just me just, kind of sitting there and just kind of daydreaming about it, sometimes thinking. Sometimes if I'm struggling with that, or I know if I ever have a plot pro problem, I'll force myself to daydream. And what I'll often do is I'll cut out pretty pieces of paper and put the characters' names on them, or I'll print out pictures of the houses or something that might remind me of the characters. And I'll just kind of move them around and jot down words and add post-it notes. And so I'll literally, for my writing time for the day, I'll log two hours of daydreaming, which is just me cutting out pretty pieces of paper and moving them around and adding words here and there. But often I find I come out of one of those sessions and sometimes the, the tactile nature helps me stay daydreaming rather than getting lost on the internet or on Twitter. Um, but sometimes I'll come out of one of those two hour sessions and like that is where the, the really cool stuff happens. You know, when I force myself to let myself just play with these ideas and, and play with these stories. And sometimes I can do that while I'm writing. Um, you know, I'll be writing a scene and I'll just kind of jot down the ideas and I'll just let myself think about it. But sometimes I like taking it away from the notepad, away from the computer and just allowing myself to just daydream and counting that, you know, by saying, because I, I keep a writing log and by saying, this counts as writing time, like this gets logged, it, it allows me, to, it gives me permission to sit there and cut paper for two hours. So. Whatever jogs the creative process, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, one more question and Mark, I'll let you answer this one first. Uh, what is your favorite genre to read you would absolutely never write? Oh boy. Um... I read a lot of different things. Probably the one that I would never attempt to write would be something along the lines of like the Gray Man series, where it's like a military spy kind of thing. They're very entertaining. They're great stories. It's an area that I have absolutely no knowledge about. Uh, never been in the military, wouldn't know how to go about researching something like that or to make it realistic. But I enjoy reading those kind of stories. I've dabbled a little bit in horror. I write some romance as well as mysteries. But um, I don't think I could even come close to doing a good job on something like that. Well, I, I've read some of your work. So I think that if you did uh, try, you, it would probably be amazing. Oh. But right. um, a it's a fun question. So I'll put it to our, Rachel and Catherine. Is there anything you enjoy reading, but you would just never write? So I really enjoy reading like dystopian from time to time because the world building is just, it, it honestly, like if I'm in a funk, if I read a dystopian novel and just the way that they, the imagery that just runs through my head, that world building aspect of it, I absolutely love it. And it tends to like kick my creative juices in gear. Um, but I know I could never write that. Um, it's just, it's, it doesn't, there's no draw for me to write that. And I don't, I, I can visualize what people are describing, but I could, I, I can't do that myself. So I'd say dystopian is probably the one genre for me just because 
it's, it's fun to read, but I would struggle so hard trying to put my thoughts on paper the way they do. Yeah, dystopian world building is something else. I enjoy reading it a lot too, but I don't, I don't know if I could ever come up with something like that. Catherine, is there any uh, genre that you like to read that you would just never write? Um, I mean, I read pretty much all genres, which is, I, I find it's useful to kind of keep myself fresh by reading all sorts of genres. Um, I've never been particularly interested in writing romance, but I often include romance subplots. So I know I could write a romance because if I can write a romance subplot, then I probably, you know, would be able to figure out how to write a romance. Like I've got at least like the attraction down and, you know, maybe the structure would be, take me some, you know, serious work, you know, is that might be a genre I'm less interested in writing right now. Um, I've always been really drawn to, I used, I've written a lot of science fiction and fantasy short stories and now I, but they always have mystery elements and now I'm writing mystery and I've always loved mystery. Um, maybe, you know, I, I really do love reading romance and so maybe someday I will but right now that's probably the genre that I'm like I don't you know I'm not particularly I'm not writing that right now but I hate to say I would never write something like I wrote a memoir as an undergrad and I wrote you know like I, I like dabbling in things especially with short stories because then I can be like well what would happen if I tried to be more literary or what would happen if I tried to you know try out this this genre so yeah, I think that's a great response. Never say never because you don't know where your writing journey is going to take you. Very well, true. this has been a real treat to have three amazingly talented local authors join us this evening. I hope all of you watching at home um, also enjoyed learning more about these authors and feel free to check out their websites. Um, buy and review their books, or uh, you can also find some of them at your local library. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you.